Let's do that again. And all God's people said, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> we have been going through Luke, and we looked last week at how Jesus was in the temple. The teacher, the rabbi, was in the temple and challenging them because he actually said from a reading in Isaiah, he said, this has been today fulfilled in your hearing. He was saying, these scriptures speak of me. They knew he was making a claim to be God, which he very well deserved to make that claim because he is, but they didn't expect that. And they took him to a cliff and they were going to kill him. And he freaked out and jumped off the cliff. No, he walked through the crowd because he still had authority, even though they had plans to kill him because he, they thought, was a blasphemer. And he walked right through the crowd and went on his way and continued his ministry. His time had not come. He's in control, even when it seems like he's not. And uh, he definitely is in our lives as well, even when it seems like he's not. So today we are looking at um, Peter and uh, one of the confessions of Peter. We know his great confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. We see another one today that Peter is going to make, and it's interesting. We're going to see a progression in Peter's growth, and it's one that we can parallel to the progression in our lives and uh, realize that Peter didn't um, uh, move as quickly as we might assume. If you read the gospel gospels and kind of isolated from one another, you get one impression. But if you read all the gospels and let them fill in the blanks with each other, you get a good perspective of the life of Christ and the events around his life. So let's look at verse 31 in chapter 4 of Luke. Verse 31. And he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. So he has been teaching them in Nazareth. Now he leaves town and goes down to Capernaum. So y'all can picture, if you will, I don't have a map, but you've got the Dead Sea, you got the Jordan River going north, and then you've got the Sea of Galilee. That's the freshwater lake, large, large lake. And on the tip of that sea, Gennesaret, Gal uh, Sea of Galilee, whatever it's called, in both cases, is Capernaum. All right, so that gives you some idea. Pretty far north in the region of Galilee, but not too far from his hometown of Nazareth. And that was his childhood home. But we understand, too, if you look on your outline, you'll see Jesus' home base for ministry is actually in Capernaum. Uh, which I think is very interesting. It says, leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelled, lived in Capernaum. And we see him many other places. That's where he's launching his ministry from. It's where he goes back to when he goes home. And so um, Capernaum, oddly enough, means the village of Nahum, the minor prophet, Nahum. Nahum means comforter. And there are no accidents in God's word. He puts names and sentences, everything together, so that we can see a message in that. Isn't it interesting that he says later, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to come to you. And here Jesus is from a town that means Comforter, the village of the Comforter. And that's what he is. And they were amazed, verse 32, at his teaching, for his message was, what's the word? With authority. If you don't have that underlined, you may underline that right out to the side. Power with authority, with power. He spoke very differently from what they were used to in the other teachers of that time. And then he comes across an opportunity to help someone get delivered of this demonic presence in his life. We're going to go in detail later in another study on that. I'll just read through it because I really want to hit some other things in order to get through what I'd like to cover today. And there was a man in the synagogue possessed by a spirit of an unclean demon. The spirit of an unclean demon possessed him, and with a loud voice he cried out, Ha! What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him without doing him any harm. And amazement came upon them all, and they began discussing with one another, saying, What is this message? For with, and there you can underline, authority and power, I've got the New American Standard, um, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And the report about him was getting out into every locality in the surrounding district. And so this was very unsettling for the people around, but not for the Son of God, not for God in the flesh. He said, get out of him. He spoke with authority and said, go. He said, be quiet. And um, so he cast out a demon 
And then uh, continuing, so he shows he's got authority over the spiritual. And it says, and he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's home. And Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. And they made a request of him on her behalf. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever and it left her. And she immediately arose and waited on them. So he shows that he has authority over the spiritual, and he shows here he has authority over the physical as well. So we see he's, he comes to Simon's house, otherwise known as Peter, and his mother-in-law is there. We'll come back to that. But this wasn't, and again, like I said, the Gospels complement one another. You fill in the blanks when you look at all the Gospels in the same context, in the same setting, the same story in different versions or different of the four Gospels. Um, and we see over in John, it's on your outline, John 1, it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which means Peter. So again, we get more information here that this instance that we see in Luke 4, where he came to Simon's family's house, is not the first encounter with Simon Peter. The first encounter was when he met him. So Peter meets Jesus, and then he's sort of engaged with him a little bit, involved with him, following along, and then he uh, has this, sees this miracle happen with this sickness, this illness. This fever, by the way, was not just, okay, it was 99, it may have been 100, maybe even 101, when they say fever in this context, it was a serious life-threatening fever. And uh, that was the, the strength of the word there. And so she was probably on her deathbed. And so he comes and says, you're all well. And he speaks it with authority. And again, because he's God, he can do that. But did you notice something there in verse 38? Look at it again. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered in Simon's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law. So apparently the first pope was married. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'm seeing here because it says that Peter had a mother-in-law, which means he had a wife. That's right. He had a wife. So you can write that down on your, <laughs> on your outline that Peter was married. It says she immediately got up and served them. By the way, we also see in other uh, parts of the scriptures and the gospels that the other disciples, most of whom were also married. We see that as well. Um, so you see that, and many of them had their wives traveling with them. So she immediately got up and served them. The word there, diaconeo, is uh, the word from which we get deacon. And deacon in a church is someone who is a servant, someone who serves. And usually it's the physical needs, you know, someone who might help cleaning or all this and serving in certain ways. Um, but a, a deacon is going to uh, be a servant in the church. And that's a, a transliteration of the word served. But I had always had this understanding that she got up and made him a sandwich. But I think it's much more than that. <laughs> She's not just fixing a meal. She got up and served them diaconeo. She served them and said, whatever you need, I'm here I'll take care and make sure that you guys can do the ministry you're called to do, and I'm going to serve behind the scenes. And that's what a servant does in the church. Someone says, I love the Lord, and I really want to serve. I see what he's done in my life, and in my church, and in my world, and my family. I want to serve and see what I can do to make sure that the ministry continues to flourish. And so that was, I believe, her heart in saying that, much more than serving a meal. So go to verse 40. And while the sun was setting, all, if you will underline the word all, there in verse 40, who had any sick with various diseases, brought them to him. And laying his hands on every one of them, I underlined every one as well, he was healing them. And demons also were coming out of many, crying and saying, you are the son of God, and rebuking them. He would not allow them to speak because they knew him to be the Christ. So again, we see that he was healing the sick and delivering people spiritually as well. Same thing we saw in those first verses. He's continuing that to both sides of that ministry. So 
in verse 40, it says, while the sun was setting. The sun was setting means, you want to write down, that the Sabbath was over. And so when the Sabbath over, good Jews wouldn't bring uh, someone, wouldn't work, if you will, on the Sabbath. And so they said, waited for the Sabbath, maybe around 6 p.m., 5-ish. And they said, okay, we're going to go and we're going to bring the sick or oppressed to him so he can, can heal. So they were being kosher since the Sabbath was over. And that's what we see there. And they could, could, could go to work again. But in verse 41, the demons were coming out of many, crying out and saying, you are the son of God. I want you to notice that, that we don't see we do see it in, in, the, in the, the advent, in the, the Christmas story, that um, the angels declared, Emmanuel is here, he's, he's with you and all this. And the angel came and spoke to Mary, came separately and spoke to Joseph. But throughout his ministry, it wasn't the angels that are declaring who Jesus is, that he's God in the flesh. It's the other side. It's the dark side that is declaring that. Why do you think that is? Well, they wanted him to get some bad press. Well, let me rephrase that. They wanted him to get some good press from the wrong source. So that's what's happening. He's getting good press, but it's from the wrong source. You never want to hear the devil say, you're doing a good job. You never, none of us want, want to hear that. And like, Anybody with me on that? Y'all with me? You yeah, you don't want to hear the devil say, you know what? You're doing a great job in life. No, that's kind of creepy. Well, that's what's happening here. It says, they were saying, you are the son of God. He rebuked them. He would not let them speak. He said, be quiet. They knew him to be the Christ, which means they knew him to be the Messiah. They knew him to be Emmanuel, God with us. He wouldn't let them speak because it was coming from the wrong source. And this is why Jesus shut them up. So verse 42, and when day came, he departed and went to a lonely place. And the multitudes were searching for him and came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So I'm going to circle back to Simon. Jesus is out doing this wonderful ministry. We saw over in John where he met um, Simon, because Andrew, his brother, went and got him and said, you got to meet this guy, right? And he met him, goes and heals Simon's uh, mother-in-law completely. She's totally well. And then uh, if you look on your outline again, you see something from Mark 1 that also shows that Peter's kind of following along with Jesus. It says very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went out to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. And Jesus replied, let us, not let me, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. And that's why I've come. So Peter now is following still, but more closely. He's wanting to be with Jesus a little more, but he still has his fishing business. He's heard about Jesus. He's been enamored with him. He said, there's something here. He follows closely. He says, a miracle at his mother-in-law's house. Now he's following. He says, I want to go where you're going. You're going off to pray. Can I go too? He takes Peter, James, and John, even Andrew. So he's following much more closely, but he's still, if you will, part-time. So you want to write down, Peter follows Jesus part-time for a season. And so Peter's following along. So Peter, and as you'll see as the story develops, you're going to see perhaps yourself. I know I saw myself in this, in my journey with Christ. And Peter, like I said, he's, he's fascinated with Jesus. He senses the love of God coming out of him. He sees the miracles, but he's still kind of half in. He's still doing his thing over here. And there's a progression that is happening in his heart and in his life. And that's going to play out. And we'll see that. So chapter five begins. Uh, you'll see on your outline a few months later, back in Capernaum with Peter back running the fishing company. Now, before we get into the stuff at the bottom of the left-hand column, go to the top of the right. 
because um, we're looking at, going to look at uh, that, that passage in just a moment. And so go to chapter 5 in your Bible. Now it came about that while the multitude were pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. Again, that's the same as the Sea of Galilee, the lake of Gennesaret, listening to Jesus. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. So again, at this point, Simon's not following Jesus. He'd been out running his company, okay? And asked him to put out a little way from the land, and he sat down and began teaching the multitudes from the boat. And if you've, if you've been on a lake, and we have a lake in our neighborhood, and we can be on the dam, and there can be somebody a few hundred yards away on the lake, and you can talk at this level right here, and they can hear you. You have tried that? It's amazing how sound carries over water. So he, being God, had a good idea. He knows that sound carries. He created sound. And so he's out in the boat, and he speaks to the multitudes, and they all hear him perfectly because the water carries the sound to them. And so he's teaching from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water. And there's a, a parallel there, I, I believe. He's saying, we're putting out in deep water. But Pete, I'm about to call you. You're about to be inspired to follow me even more closely than you have been. And let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. So when, when the Lord calls you to do something, and he says, do this. And you say, Lord, no. <laughs> is, he really, is he really Lord, right? And so he said, Master, we, we got nothing. But then he says, he catches it. And he says, but at your bidding, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. And they signaled to the partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. That's a lot of fish. These boats, to give you an idea, were probably about eight or nine feet wide and about 25 to 27 feet long. And they've actually, actually exhumed one of these fishing boats from this era, from the lake, um, uh, pretty cool, and, and restored it as best they can. But uh, they have a pretty good idea what that fishing boat was like. And so uh, you can imagine, that's a lot of fish that, uh, that were weighing down those boats. And again, we'll circle back to that too. But I want to talk about verses 4 through 6, and this is where hopefully the, I'll connect the dots for us. When scholars look at these verses, these words, these sentences in the original, and some manuscripts um, are reliable perfectly, some manuscripts they say, well, there's some contradiction here, and so forth and so on. Well, there's no contradiction in these, in these scriptures. There's... Um, a difference in interpretation from those who interpret them. And so some in the New American Standards, one of them says, say that um, he, Jesus said, put out your nets, plural, right? And Simon says, we'll let down our nets at the end of verse five. Can y'all see who has nets plural at the end of verse five besides me? Anybody else? There's one. Okay. Who has singular net? There you go. Okay, so I know what version of the Bible we have. So if you look at the right-hand column on your outline, I want you to see, this is from, as you see at the bottom there, King James, New King James, um, the Young's Literal Translation, and others that translate it this way. And I, I just for fun, let's just imagine that this way is what he really responded with. Here's what it says. And when he left off speaking, he said unto Simon, put back to the deep and let down your nets, plural, they don't agree there, for a drought, drought. Um, and Simon began uh, answering him, said to him, Master, through the whole night, having labored, we have taken nothing, but at thy saying, I'll let down the net. So some say it's a plural word there, some say it's a singular word there. I think that's significant, and I'll see, we'll see why. And having done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net was breaking. So if that is indeed how it was said and how it was done, and they let out, they threw out one net instead of saying, we'll throw them all out. I believe this is, would be maybe a paraphrase of what Peter said or was thinking. Look, Jesus, I get it, but you got to understand, we're experienced fishermen, you're not. 
So we know that the fish have already gone deeper as they do every day. But to pacify you, Jesus, we'll let down a net. Verse 6 again. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish in their nets began to break because and you see in the next verse, they called their friends over, help us, and they threw out more nets to pull in more fish, right? What would have happened if they had let all the nets out? Maybe they would have needed even more boats to help out, bring in all the fish. Verse 7 tells us they had to call for backup. So what's the lesson? Go back to the previous column at the bottom of the left-hand side of your outline. I want you to write this down. And this is just possibly, this is, you know, if that was the case, and that's the way it's translated. But the fact is that limited blessing is due to limited obedience. Because of limited faith in Jesus' word. Limited blessing due to limited obedience because of limited faith in Jesus' word. He said to do one thing. And they said, I'll do part of what you're saying. Many people miss out on what God has for them because they don't fully obey what he says. Maybe in their minds, they say, well, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that to pacify him because I know he wants me to do that, but I'm going to hold back the rest. And we see the blessing that came. They were blessed amazingly, even in the obedience they did have, even in the amount that they did put out there. But what would have happened had they obeyed fully? How much greater would the blessing have been? Another thing to consider is what if Peter had said when Jesus said, put your nets out again. And Peter had said, mm, no, we're tired and we're exhausted and we didn't sleep all night and whatever excuse he would say. Jesus, you stick to preaching, we'll stick to fishing. What would the result have been? Zero fish. Because he would have heard the word, but he responded with disobedience and said, no. Master, Lord, boss, no. <laughs> they, don't, they don't connect. And so... Um, and Jesus would have said, no fish for you, no, no fish, <laughs> no fish for you, you know, but Jesus wants to bless. And that's the heart that I want us to see. He wanted to bless them abundantly, powerfully, more than they could ask or imagine. So what does this all mean for us? What, what difference can this lesson make in our lives? Well, keep reading. When Simon Peter saw this miracle, he fell down at Jesus' feet and said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also James and John's, John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. And now Jesus is all in. He's all in. So we'll go back and look at those verses again. But I want you to see verse 8. He came and he said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. He didn't want to um, obey fully, surrender fully until that moment. But when he realized, 
I've been kind of just pacifying you and doing what I thought I could do and keep my own thing over here and obey you just enough, Lord. But um, you brought me to a place where I realize that I've been wrong. So let's look at that together. And on your outline, you'll see. First thing I want you to note is that God is concerned about our immediate needs. Immediate needs. Would you agree in reading this account of this fishing business that um, was having a really poor time doing it on their own, did much better when Jesus got involved? Would you agree that he, he showed them that he can do it much better than they? And that's what he wanted them to see, and that's what he wants us to see. He showed them that he can meet their immediate needs. Their immediate needs were providing for their families. Their immediate needs were met abundantly by him, by the way, and he can also care for your needs too and mine. It says from Mark, without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And I have underlined with the hired men on my outline because that tells us this is a thriving business. This isn't a couple of guys going out and fishing every once in a while and making enough money for the week. He has employees and he walked away from it. And the Lord said, watch this. And he almost sinks two boats with his provision, knowing they're walking away from that business. He says, I've got you. But there's something else about this miracle that I want us to, to note. So you want to write down, this miracle required participation. Participation. They are tired, yet they go ahead and they push the boats out. They go ahead and they cast a net. They go ahead and they pull in the catch. That was hard. There was a lot of work pulling that in. They didn't just sit back. They pulled it in. They may even clean the fish. And yet, so often, here's what I hear someone pray. Well, if it's God's will, it'll happen. You ever hear that? Well, God's will was to bless them. But God's will also in this miracle involved participation. He didn't say, hey, fish, jump in the boat. That's not how it went. It went by him saying, here's what I want you to do and watch what I'm going to do when you do what I tell you to do. So often when someone said, well, if it's God's will, it, it really breeds passivity. And we find ourselves not seeing God move because we're not getting involved in what he's leading us to do. Instead, wanting him to do it all. In Matthew 6, we see Jesus teaching about this. He says, the birds of the air, your father feeds them. Have you, anybody here ever seen a starving bird? <laughs> no, and you won't. Birds always have what they need, but boy, do they work. They hustle. They get out there. I hear them at five something in the morning in our house. <laughs> Lots of trees. They're out there and they're busy and they're looking for what God has provided and for them by the instinct in them to go find it and to search it out. And so they are fed by God but they don't hang out in the nest waiting for God to drop a worm in the basket, in the nest, right? And so uh, this miracle requires participation. And so often what God wants to do in our lives re re involves our participation with him. Number three, God is the God of abundance. Abundance. He's not the God of just enough. He's not the God of never enough. He's the God of abundance. And I want to look at this a bit in some verses to support that. When Jesus blessed them with overflowing boats, almost sinking, would you say that the business got back to break even? Or would you say the business was really profitable that day? It may have been profitable for weeks, I don't know how the math adds up or the accounting figures on that, but they probably had 
a surplus. Would you agree? Well, that's the way, and that's his heart for them, and that's his heart for us. It wasn't just to get their business back to zero and break even. It was to bless them. Psalm 35 verse 27 says, Let them say continually, The Lord be magnified, who delights in the what? You can say it. Be brave. Come on. Prosperity. Thank you. Of his servant. Do you know why you hesitate to say that? Because of the prosperity preachers. The prosperity preachers say this. I want you to bless me with what I want, and I'll thank you for it, Lord. Does that sound like what you've heard the prosperity preachers say? Biblical prosperity says this, God, you want to bless me with what you want, and I will thank you for it. You see the difference? One thing that I believe will help us in our perspective of biblical prosperity and how God wants to bless us is realizing and be reminded of, and we saw this when we went through the Lord's Prayer series that we did months ago, And that is that we are made in the image of God. And being made in the image of God, we understand, those of you who are parents, even those who are your children, um, and and not parents yet, you understand that a parent, a mom, a dad, doesn't want to see the child just barely eek by. Doesn't want to see the child uh, have a foreclosed house or a repossessed car. That parent wants to see that child prosper. Would you agree? Well, that's because you're made in the image of God, and God wants to see you prosper. He wants, He loves it when His children prosper. And what a great witness it is when the children of God prosper. Again, not to say, God, give me what I want, and I'll get back to you, to say, God, I know you want to bless me, and thank you, God, and just to see Him do that, that He blesses the way He blesses, and so often it is abundantly and so, is that distinction clear on that? That's important. And I just want to make sure that, that we're, we're good there because uh, there is so much stuff uh, out there that um, I feel like that's important. Another verse, in fact, from 3 John 1 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest, what? Let's all do it together. One, two, three. Prosper. <laughs> Thank you. And be in health, even as thy soul prospers. And so um, we don't um, we don't have to uh, give in to the, I guess, the false teachers in order to believe in biblical prosperity. Biblical prosperity says, I'm going to take care of you. If God takes care of the flowers of the field, how much more will he clothe you? you know, and, and we look at God and all the beauty and the provision in the world around us, knowing that he also wants to provide for us and prosper us. So back to verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Might be the first time he's called him Lord. This is, one, like I said earlier when we started, um, a great confession of Peter. We know about his confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? Soon after that, denied him three times. But he had a great confession and that great faith that he had for that moment. But here, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Lord, depart from me. I can't face you right now. I'm ashamed of my pride. Is it interesting to you that Peter doesn't say, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, when he meets Jesus? He doesn't say something like that. When he sees the miracle at his mother-in-law's house, she's completely miraculously healed. He doesn't say, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. He's like, wow, that was cool. Thank you, Lord, that was great. When is it that he says, depart from me? He says, depart from me, when he is faced, when he comes face to face with his pride, And his pride is exposed. And he realizes, I was just giving you lip service. I was just just pacifying you saying, okay, I'll go ahead and put out again. This is really going to work. Forgive me, Lord, because I was not being authentic with you. It was my pride. Pride. 
you want to write down, Peter thought God could only use pious people. Peter thought God could only use pious people. In other words, he was kind of going through the motions. He thought, he thought God, God could only use people who have it all together. And, and I love it because I feel like, you know, amazement has seized him and his companions because of the catch of fish and all this. But I mean, it was not about the fish. It was about the one in the boat, the one who caught them and is catching their hearts. And I feel like when Peter says, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, I feel like Jesus said, ah, now you're getting it. <laughs> That's not in the original language, by the way. That's just <laughs> conjecture. But <laughs> now you're getting closer to the kingdom. Now you're understanding who I really am. And he did that without even saying that, right? And so And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear, verse 10, from now on, you will be catching people. Zogreo. Zogreo, on your outline, you see their catch from the same as other places to take alive. Um, what it literally means, this isn't in your notes, means you'll be catching men for life. That's the literal, you'll be catching men for life and life eternal. That's what's going to be happening in your world. So you want to write this down. Jesus reveals that it is humility that makes us usable. And that's what happened in Peter at that moment. He went from a proud business owner and said, I'm going to follow you every once in a while, Jesus. I'm going to follow you even closely. And there's a progression. We see that and that's good. He's progressing in his walk with God. But then when he sees his own pride and he comes face to face with it, he becomes usable because he's broken at that point. And Jesus reveals that it's humility that makes us usable. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. They had left some things. They had given up some time. They had given up some conveniences. But now they leave everything and follow him. And he already has shown them they're going to be taken care of. They're going to be taken care of as they follow the leading. So finally, I want you to jot down, there's a progression in following him. Peter is growing just like we are. And, and Peter doesn't follow him full time until he has grown through several encounters. And following Jesus full time, full time ministry and all that, that is not what God is, his will is for all of us. Yes, all of us are ministers in the world and workplaces where he has placed us. But for Peter, it was a progression that brought him to that place where he said, all right, it's time for you to follow me full time. And, and he let Peter see that through this encounter. So it's until he had grown through several experiences with Jesus and with us, God is helping us progress to the next steps with him. You know, I had for so long, kind of without looking at all the context of Simon Peter's relationship with Jesus, had for so long seen Simon and Andrew out there fishing. Jesus comes, says, follow me, and they drop everything and they go. That's not what happened. There was a progression, and there's a progression in our lives. And the Lord says, I'm going to take that from you now. That's something you're holding on to and it's hindering your walk. And in fact, it's hindering your ministry. I'm going to go, just give that to me. And we're like, we're at a place in our faith walk with him that we say, okay, God, it's yours. And then later we're walking along with Jesus and we're growing. And he says, okay, let's go ahead and, and, and do this now. Maybe it's not taking something. Maybe it's stepping out in a way. Maybe it's participating with him in a miracle he wants to do in you or in your family, in your ministry, in your work. So with us, God is helping us progress to the next steps with him. The commitment to the Lord in our lives, just like in, Jesus, in, in Peter, continues to grow. Our commitment to him, our surrender to him, our yielding to him in our lives, it continues to grow. So the encouraging word for you is be patient where you, with where you are today, with where you are in your faith walk with him. What is it that he's leading? It may not be that he's saying, okay, drop everything, leave the boats and follow me. I got you. Don't do that unless God is saying, do that. It may be that he's saying something small. He's saying, hey, surrender that or step out here. 
or trust me with trust me with this. And so um, I believe that's what the Lord has for us in this passage today to take a word from uh, one of my favorites, Peter. And by the way, Peter was one of my is one of my favorites because he only opened his mouth to insert his foot, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> to change feet. That's what it is. Only open his mouth to change feet. That's what it is. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's all stand. And uh, <laughs> if God can use Pete, he can use me, right? Oh, uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that as an old preacher said, you can hit straight licks with crooked sticks. And Lord, you have chosen us and you don't ask us to get it all together before you use us. And I'm so thankful that you don't. Lord, you call us and you use us and you encourage us and you're patient with us and you bless us abundantly. Because we're made in your image, Lord. To be made in your image is no one wants to see their child suffer or barely make it. Lord, we want to see them prosper. And Lord, we are children. And you want the same for us. So thank you, God. Thank you for the lesson we have in this encounter. And thank you that your Holy Spirit is faithful to continue to teach us as we leave. Lord, thank you for this fellowship of believers. Thank you for their love for you, their love for your word. Keep us all till we meet again. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.